Welcome to this presentation of Human Life International. The following talk entitled, Speaking a Language of Life and Family, was given by Father Shannon J. Bouquet, President of Human Life International, April 2015, at the Eucharistic Convention in Auckland, New Zealand. For more information about HLI, please visit us on the web at hli.org. To order more copies of this presentation, visit us online or call 1-800-549-LIFE. That's 1-800-549-5433. Now, let's proceed with our featured presentation. First of all, it's very good to be with you this blessed day. And as with many of the speakers, uh, this is my first trip my first mission trip to New Zealand, and it is indeed a great joy to visit your beautiful country. And uh, unlike some of the speakers whose time here is a little limited, I have the joy and privilege of being here till April 24th. So I will have a chance to visit uh, a good portion of your country over the next uh, week and a half plus. So it is indeed a great, great joy. So let's begin with a prayer. And to that we shall use sacred scripture as a way of entering into this discussion about speaking a language of life and family, a language. So let's listen to the one who is the author of language, who speaks to us. While the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Genesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake. But the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had ceased speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon Peter answered, Master, we have toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a great shoal of fish. And as their nets were breaking, they beckoned to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, Lord. For Simon was astonished at all that was with him and the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Again, let us listen attentively. Do not be afraid. Henceforth, you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to the land, they left everything and followed him. And so, Father, we come to the last talk of this day. We have listened attentively to many voices speaking many things and the truths about your profound love for us, beckoning us to listen, to put out our nets into new waters, into the deep, to walk away from our own control, to surrender, to truly speak a different language, one of which does not originate in us, but originates in you. Strengthen our resolve in this room 
to be truly a people of life, a people who speak not their language, not our language, but yours. Help us to completely detach from the things of this world so as to be free in order to serve. Help us to want, to yearn, to seek, as given to us in the Gospel of Matthew in the seventh chapter. Ask, and you shall receive. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. We seek, we ask, we knock. Like Peter, we have been busy. We have caught nothing. But as you reveal to Peter and the sons of Zebedee that all things are possible because of you. All things become possible because of you. This is the language that you speak, a language that's more than an emotion we call love, because you are love. And as St. John teaches us in his inspired word, he who lives in God lives in love, and God lives in him. May we speak this language, and may we be attentive to it, not only now, but every day of our lives. We ask all this in your name, Jesus, who is Lord of life and love forever and ever. Amen. And that word, amen, is very important, is it not? Because what does it mean? Let it happen. So be it. So remember that what we just said and we invoked in prayer the end of it is, let it happen. Let it become reality. This is what it means to speak the language of God, to really open our lives not to our voice, not to our definitions of life, not to what we believe life is all about, but what is God revealing to us? What has God revealed to us? And what is God continuing to reveal to us? We have heard some beautiful presentations, some very challenging presentations, and the last, of course, a very one filled with emotion and calling us to, to be involved in the culture of life. And it's interesting that in 1993, at World Youth Day, it was John Paul II who coined this phrase, culture of life. Not for the first time, we had seen those words combined, but for the first time, the Supreme Pontiff is speaking a language and putting us in a direction of how we're going to live out our faith. And how are we going to build a culture of life, which we're going to talk about more tomorrow in the afternoon. But to realize in order to build that culture of life, in order to change the direction of the culture, we have to be able to speak a language. And it has to be a language that is truly anchored, not in our verbiage, but in the verbiage of God, in the wisdom of God, to seek that which God wishes. Amen? All right, so I know it's been a long day and it's the last talk of the day and I know everyone is getting tired, but what I want to do, and God has placed me at the end of this day for a reason, not just because Mr. John and the committee said, okay, we're going to put Father Boki at the end of the list today. They did that, but God desired that to be so. And, and as I listened to the presentations today and as I began to reflect on them, I realized that what God wanted me to do today in my presentation on and that language of life and love is to kind of bring together what everybody else has been talking about. And if we think for a moment, whether we're talking about the last presentation about this beautiful story of how this wonderful child of God at the beginning of life was already at being threatened, and yet in this great miraculous moment, her life is given opportunity that her mother never anticipated. And yet here is this wonderful child of God today herself proclaiming not her message, but a message of life and love, 
a message of salvation, a message of intervention, a message when God says, I choose, choose you and long for you. It makes me think of Mother Teresa's words. She said, if we only understood what those words, I thirst, I thirst for you. Remember, we hear those words from the cross when Jesus says, I thirst. And she says, again, those words speak to the heart of every one of us, that God so loved the world that in the fullness of time he sent his only son not to condemn the world, but to save the world. His name means he who saves, Jesus. And what does he who saves speak? And from where does he speak it from? From the tree of life though many perceived it to be the tree of death. And as Father Thomas shared with us this afternoon, how we eat from this tree of life, how God gives to us himself to nourish us, to strengthen us. And so this thirst that God has for us is from the fountain of which we draw the language of which he wants us to speak in this world this language of life and love, this language of transformation, this power that comes from a genuine source outside of ourselves, which we heard Leah speak to us about. These wonderful reality that she came to understand through her own search and her own diligence, persevering, even in the moments of confusion and even in the moments of pride, she came to realize that outside of herself was the truth that she could not explain. And this truth said these simple words, I thirst for you. I thirst for you. And it's interesting, in his encyclical, God is Love, Deus Caritas Est, I'm going to go all the way to the end of the encyclical. And... Pope Benedict gives us a beautiful language of exactly what I just was refer referencing. He says, faith, which sees the love of God revealed in the pierced heart of Jesus on the cross, gives rise to love. Love is the light, and in the end, the only light that can always illuminate a world grown dim and give us the courage needed to keep living and working. Love is possible, and we are able to practice it because we are created in the image of God. To experience love in this way, to cause the light of God to enter into the world. This is the invitation Pope Benedict says, I would like to extend with this encyclical, an invitation. Family, that's what I want to talk to us about today, is what can we do? How can we truly transform the culture in which we live? We just heard staggering numbers and Human Life International, who has been at this work now for over 40 years, has seen these statistics continue to grow, where human life is threatened every place around the world. There is no place in this world where life is not threatened. Whether that life be at the beginning, in the most vulnerable of places, in the womb of mom, or at the end of life, when our most vulnerable elderly and sick are in need, but yet a world wants to snuff them out because it doesn't have time to love. The language that I grew up with in my own family, and, and even though as the good deacon shared those numbers, and last week I had the joy of celebrating the funeral mass of my grandfather who lived to be 96 years of age, and the great witness of the testimony that in that room of 135 grandchildren, and, a, and the numbers of great-grandchildren and the great-great-grandchildren all present in this great church were celebrating the gift of a man who spoke a different language. He wasn't a perfect man. 
I'm not a perfect man. But that man, like this man, like each of you, heard the words of Jesus. Be perfected as your heavenly Father is perfect. Are we striving to live the language of God? Are we striving in our every day to embrace the truth that resides outside of us, an objective truth that is yearning for us, calling us, beckoning us, inviting us, and asking us to live not in ourselves and for ourselves in a selfish, self-centered way, but to live in the freedom of a love that has been given. Hear the words of Gin of Sacred Scripture. It is not you who have chosen me, it is I who have chosen you. It is not you who loved me first, it is I who loved you first. And again, if we hear in the Gospel of John in the 15th chapter, and we hear when Jesus uses his great teaching of the image of the vine, and I'll just sum it in this way when he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Now we can understand what that is because you see, what Jesus is saying is that the language of life is found in him and him alone. And all we have to do is if we had a, a, a week together, we could go outside, break a branch off of one of those trees, bring it in here, and at first glance, our senses would look at it and say, it's still alive. It still would have green sap running through its vein. It would still have green leaves. It would look like it's still alive. But every day if we came in and looked at it and observed it, we would see a gradual change. And eventually, what will happen to that branch? It dies. It cannot sustain itself. No matter what, if the branch could speak, if it could think, if it could rationalize, no matter what it could do, it would come to the realization that it is dying because it has no ability to sustain itself. And neither can we. Life begins and ends in the author of life. And the one who is speaking a language, a language that is invitational, a language that says, if you want to live, come and follow me. To the rich young man who came and said, what must I do to inherit everlasting life? Then Jesus says, follow the commandments. And the young man's heart that Jesus could read, he was a good righteous man. He knew that he was following those commands. But what did the Lord say? There is one thing still lacking. Go and be rid of everything you own and come and follow me. That's a different language, isn't it? It's a different language. The young man, remember what happened? What did he do? He walked away. Saddened. Why? Because the language of which Jesus was speaking didn't match up with his own. Isn't that also the teaching we hear of the man born blind? And remember, the religious leaders said, you know, this man is a sinner. That's why he's blind. And Jesus corrected it. And then at the end of that great teaching, what does which revealed is something so powerful that it convicts every one of us in this room. Remember, the religious leaders claimed to see. And Jesus says to them, you remember what he said? It is you who are blind, he says. You see, they weren't hearing the language. And in a way, isn't that what's still happening today? People aren't hearing the language. A language that is transforming. A language that calls us out of our selfishness. Deny yourself, he said. Pick up your cross, he said. Come and follow me, he said. And as we heard Father Thomas remind us in chapter 5 of the Beatitudes of Matthew's Gospel, it's a different language. Blessed are the poor in spirit, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor. Sounds ridiculous. 
Give up everything I have? Sounds absurd. John's gospel that Father referenced this morning or this afternoon as well, when he spoke about his body and blood, and remember, many people walked away from him because they found the teaching too difficult, a different language. And again, as we just heard, how many times in today's world the language that people hear is happiness is found in material things. Happiness is found in the pleasures of life. Happiness is found in power. Happiness is found in financial security. Happiness is found in all the sexual promiscuities of the world. Happiness is found in that if something is blocking my happiness, like the life of a child that I didn't want, then let me be rid of that child. If my parents who are now elderly are a burden to me, I don't want to be burdened. Let me be rid of them. This is the culture of death alive today. People living purely for what their senses reveal, what their appetites want. No discipline, no ability to deny themselves. The language of Jesus is an absurdity, even today, and with respect, even inside the Catholic Church. Let me give you a story. There was a wonderful program on EWTN a few years gone by where a young man was going to leave military service and he was discerning a journey of consecrated life as a religious brother. I believe the community was Fogombo and it was a Benedictine community and this young man was going to be followed by a reporter for two weeks. Now I'll take the story and make it short because our time is limited today but to know that after two weeks of following this young man in the community the reporter on the final days is standing with the abbot and the abbot is a very tall man and beautiful smile happy and you can see this this joy just flowing from him and the reporter is agitated he's frustrated because what happens is he doesn't understand the language not the verbal language of the culture, not the language of, of which people were speaking, but the language of love being lived in that community. He said, every morning you rise early, you pray, you pray, you eat, you pray, you work, you pray, you study, you pray, you work, you eat, you pray. And this whole thing, and you can see that the young man is agitated because he doesn't understand, and the abbot is smiling more and more and more, which only agitates the reporter more and more and more. Finally, the young man says, I do not understand you don't serve a purpose. I do not see the purpose. You don't have a purpose and finally the abbot says you're absolutely correct and the reporter kind of saying wow I got a story here and the abbot looked at him speaking from a heart and said you're absolutely right we do not serve a purpose we serve a person and his name is Jesus Christ a person Pope Benedict XVI said something very similar. He said many people speak about Jesus, but very few people know him. And isn't that what Father Thomas was sharing with us? Isn't that what we heard in a way Leah talking about? Isn't that what we heard in this morning's presentations? And I don't have the program right in front of me, so I can't reference everyone's name. But in a way, think, each one of those presentations was exactly that. Talking about a person, a person, the second person of the Holy Trinity. That gift given in the incarnation was not just some story. 
This is reality. And this reality invites us to share in the language of what he is speaking. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 19. We look at this teaching on marriage, and we could spend the rest of our evening talking about this passage. But remember what he talks about when they say, well, the, Moses gave us the ability to write a writ of divorce. You know the passage. And remember what Jesus said in response? He said, it was because of the hardness of your hearts, he said. But I say to you, in the beginning, oh, wow, going back to Genesis, going back to what God constituted, a different language. Language. God is revealing something profoundly different. Profoundly different. Again, I'll use Pope Benedict's wonderful encyclical, and he references this in the Saved in Hope. And it's a very beautiful teaching about what happened during the time of Marx and the socialism that Marx helped bring into existence. And I won't read the whole passage, just one in very important part. He says, Marx not only omitted to work out how this new world would be organized, which should, of course, have been unnecessary if you followed all of Marx's thought. He says his silence on this matter follows logically from this approach. He forgot in his era to lay deeper, to go deeper into the deepness of the water. He forgot that man always remains man. He forgot man and he forgot man's freedom. He forgot that freedom always remains also the freedom for evil. In other words, family, when we remove God and the language of what God is speaking, we always revert to evil. Let's be honest with our own lives. When we take God out of the equation, we focus on ourselves and what happens. Usually, nothing good. You see, it is the language of which God is speaking that helps me to be the man I'm called to be. It is the language of which God is speaking that I learn what real freedom is. It is in the language of which God is speaking and has spoken and continues to speak through Jesus Christ and his church in the animated gifts of the Holy Spirit that we come to know who we are and the purpose of our life, the very reason we exist the very direction, of, again, of which Leah spoke about what is the meaning of my life, the very essence of the question that every one of us asks, what is the purpose of my existence? Why am I here? Where am I going? What am I supposed to be doing with my life? And Jesus answers it. And how does he answer it? He answers it by saying to us, come and follow. If you want to learn who you are, he says to us, come and follow. And what does he do? He teaches the disciples, these chosen, even his betrayer is given the same opportunity to hear the language, to hear it. Love your enemy, he says. Pray for your persecutor. How ridiculous that sounds. It makes no sense unless there's a different language, unless, there, unless there's a different way of speaking, a different way of living, a different understanding of the purpose of my life and your life. It is the ability to say to be pure for young people who are here, and there's some young adults and some young teenagers here, to live the life of purity, to live the love that God calls us as single men and women, including myself standing here as a single man, to live a chaste life. 
a life of purity, to live as God intends me and you to live, is a different language than the world who says, have what you wish, live how you want, it's your body, Be pleasure. seek the pleasures of this world, buy as much as you can, have as much as you can, no matter what you have to do to get there, no matter who you have to walk over to obtain it, this is the language of the world. The language of Jesus Christ is the opposite. And if we're going to build that culture of life, then we have to be sure that we're speaking the right language. Now, again, family, not being overly familiar with the culture that you yourselves live in. You know your culture. You know the very things of the day. How do we, as sons and daughters of God, enter into the culture with the language? How do we walk in to our work environments and our home environments and our relationships and our friendships? How do we bring the language of the gospel of life with us? How do we transform the environment around us? How do we bring a different way of understanding into our own existence? And I'm going to give you a story. I've been a priest now come June 12th, 23 years. I was ordained a deacon in, come May, in the May 24 years. I've had the joyful privilege of being and sharing in people's lives in many different occasions. And I have been in places of great tragedy. And I have seen the difference of language. Just like in the story that we just heard about abortion and the choices being made. Different language being spoken. And I remember being in a hospital on Easter Sunday, 23 years ago. Won't we'll never forget it. Easter Sunday afternoon, I just returned from spending the day afternoon with my family. And I returned to the rectory and decided it was going to be a nice, quiet afternoon. Phone rang, it was the hospital, and said, would you please come to the emergency room? There's been a death. I said, sure, I'm on my way. When I arrived, of course, being Easter Sunday, there was a lot of quietness, I mean, a lot of not, not a lot of activity, except around the emergency room doors. There was a, noticeably a family all gathered outside. And so I entered into the doors, and the nurse who I knew said, please come this way. And I went, and the doors opened, and there was under a bright light, very much like these, pointed right over the body of a little nine-year-old boy. And there was his mother sitting at his head, stroking his hair. He was electrocuted that day. The family was all gathered, celebrating Easter, and a ball had rolled underneath their home. And unbeknownst to anyone, there was a live electrical wire. And when the young boy reached for the ball, he also sadly caught this wire. He died instantly. And there was this mother, very beautifully, stroking the hair. And when I walked in, she was all by herself. The whole family had left. They were all outside. They couldn't take it. And obviously, we can understand why. And she looked at me and she said, I am so grateful for the gift of his life. And she says, is it selfish to have wanted much more time? I said, no. And she said, I wish it would have been so, but I'm grateful for what God gave to me in his life. See, that's a different language. It's a very different language. And I have also been in the room where people of faith are where there is a lack of faith. And I've been in those moments too. And the same kind of tragedy that is unexplainable, but yet the hysteria in the room is so noticeable because there's no purpose, if you will. Not the death but the idea of what is this all about. There has to be something more, but they don't understand. 
And isn't that exactly what we're up against in our culture? New Zealand is no different than many other Western countries. We have a lot of beauty, have a lot of prosperity, and many people think that their happiness is found in the material world and in the pleasures that this world brings. But in the end, listen to sacred scripture. Remember the gentleman, the parable of the man who had a surplus within his field? And remember that his silos were too small to accommodate all that he had seen in his surplus? And so remember what he did? He knocked them down, built larger silos. Pretty admirable, you think. Quite industrious. But after filling his silos, goes home and kind of says, wow, look what I've done. It's good. What happened in the parable that Jesus teaches us? He died. What did he gain in building these large silos? Jesus even says, do not put your trust in that which moth and rust destroy. And yet, how tirelessly we, we, we work for things of this world. But for what? Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6, beautiful passage. Look at the birds of the air. Look at the fish of the sea. Look at the flowers of the field. And I love, and I think it was Father Thomas, it might have been one of the other presentations, but the word duty. And I love, again, how Father did, and it's so true. You cut the one wing off of a bird, and it will. It just go in a circle, so to speak. That's just so true. I often think about that flying so much. If one of those engines falls off, is this thing going to just do this? But I try not to think of that too often, especially when I'm sitting over the wing. But the reality is, is that the bird has two wings, and it's made for a purpose, and those wings have a purpose. We have a purpose. And what I would suggest to us is that the language that we in this room need to be committed to speak is not our own language, but the language of a love of knowing the divine person, of knowing the one in whom, again, Father spoke of, that little white pebble. Remember? He talked about it. See, I'm trying to connect the talks. And matter of fact, I'm going to look for a... Uh, I do have a program. That way, I can mention names. I want you to think what Mr. Roy said, Father Thomas, and I, most of the afternoon ones, okay? And you think about what Claire just shared with us, and even what we just heard so beautifully proclaimed for us in song, the beauty of those voices were a different language, meaning they're beautiful, they lift, they pull us up. This is the language that we have to keep speaking. We have to speak a different language. We have to speak of what God's created. We have to be bold. We have to be courageous. We have to be truly a people of light. Jesus says you don't light a lamp and hide it under a tub. Where do you place it? On a stand, on a place where everybody can see it. Now, again, I'm going to read that passage because I want us to make sure that we hear what Jesus is saying. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 5. He says... You are the light of the world, a city set on a hill. I mean, imagine, th that's, that is awesome to think about. But who made us this mighty city? Who gave us this light? Jesus, God. It's the language of which God is given. And this language is what he gives us to transform the culture. And we can't do it sitting on our laurels. Okay, this is being taped, so I can't be blunt. All right, so I'm not going to use certain adjectives. But the idea here, we can't do it sitting on our backside. And we can't do it by saying, well, that's father's job. You know, that's the bishop's job. That's sister's job. It's our responsibility as disciples of the Lord to speak that language, to live that language, and to promote the family. I was in the Philippines, and I know that there are a number of Filipino families here today, 
And I've been to the Philippines six times, and it's become like a second home to me. And I was sitting in, in a hotel uh, near uh, Dr. Lagaya Costa's home, the place I usually stay at the hotel, and the staff has gotten to know me. And again, I, as you see me dressed is how I dress 99.9% .9 of the time, all right, except when I'm sleeping or playing some kind of sport, all right? So, but the idea is this young lady comes to me at breakfast and she says, Father, I want you to pray for me to find a holy husband. I said, absolutely. I would be more than happy to pray. Marriage constituted by God, one man married to one woman in an indissolvable, truly uh, fruitful relationship is a wonderful vocation. I will definitely pray for you. And she says, and, and I want to be a mother. I said, wonderful. And she says, I want two children. I said, time out. <laughs> Why only two? Now, what she had forgotten is I knew some of her story. She told me she, her father was, I believe, one of six children. Her mother was one of five children. And, I'm thinking, and she was talking about her cousins and her family and how excited it was. And I said, why two? She says, well, that's what we hear. That's what we hear. Now, again, a funny story. I was in Colorado and for a conference and and I have the very good and bad habit, love children, and I like to see children, and I like to look at babies. So when I see a, a mother pushing a baby or holding a baby, I want to see the baby, all right? I did it this afternoon. The baby was sleeping, so I couldn't see the baby too much. But it's just a joyful habit I have. So I'm going down the street, and this beautiful woman is pushing a baby carriage. And I'm looking at her saying, if this beautiful creature is so beautiful that baby's got to be gorgeous I want to see the baby all right so not a bad thing now I'm smiling at her she's coming toward me and I'm moving toward and she's smiling back so it's so good well this is going to be a good opportunity she's not going to say no so she moves closer to me and I stop I said oh good afternoon and all the little cordials and 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 I said may I see it? sure 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 so she peels back this veil I gaze in I pull back, I gaze in. It was a dog. <laughs> She's pushing a dog. Now family, sadly, this is becoming common. I see people carrying little dogs on, and I'm not, look, I grew up on a farm. I love animals, all right? Now, that's not the issue. But people are replacing family life with dogs, cats, fish, boa constrictors, I don't know. But the idea is people are afraid of children. I fly a lot, as you just heard the good deacon say. I love to watch people when, when families come on board. They are frightened to death that that kid is going to be sitting next to them. Because all they think about, it's going to be 14 hours on this plane. And they don't want to hear the baby cry. And of course, babies cry. But people are afraid of children, family life. But when you think about the divorce rate that is so high throughout the world, especially in the Western cultures, that so many of our young people are afraid of marriage because they don't understand it and they saw the brokenness of their families you see we have to speak a different language we have to reintroduce the language of God into our conversations how many young people today are cohabitating living together that's not of God that's not of God how many situations today are occurring within our cultures that is not of the teaching of Almighty God what are we doing to change it? And before any of us try to excuse ourselves, every one of us is responsible. We cannot say it's someone else's job. We are disciples. And if we know him, 
then we will love him. We will love him. Good deacon, how much time do I have left? Is it just a minute or two? Five minutes. He said five hours, that's okay? If I sing beautifully, can, can I keep going? <laughs> what I want you to, and again, families, just realize that we should not be a people of despair. We should not be discouraged. We should be a people of hope. And where does our hope come from? It comes from the Easter message. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. That is the message that strengthens our resolve. It is from that message and everything that's been communicated through that message is the language that we should be speaking in the culture. It is that which we should be sharing with every brother and sister. And it is something that, again, that we should recognize that in order to change the current direction, to reorient our cultures back to cultures of life and the dignity of marriage between one man, one woman, open to the gift of life, where our elderly are respected and loved and cared for, where we look upon the handicapped and those who are struggling with physical problems, that we don't look at them as burdens but opportunities to love and to care. When we hear the commandment of our Lord who says that you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength, and that the second is like the first, you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself that saint augustine says that the second is a response to the first that in order for me to manifest that i love god with all of my heart with all of my mind with all of my strength it becomes manifested in the language of how i live my life in relationship to my brother and sister and no brother and sister is to be left outside no brother and sister is to be ignored. No brother and sister, even the child in the womb, is a brother and sister that we need to defend. The elderly at the other end, we must defend. Every person, every person is called to hear that language. Come and follow. I love you. I thirst for you. I long for you. And family, I leave you with the challenge in a way that Claire did. Get involved. Get involved. Get involved. It's easy to point. We are called. We are salt and light. We have been entrusted with a language that is not ours, but belongs to God. Beautiful image, divine mercy. Jesus, I trust in you. As I opened up this with a prayer from Gospel of Luke chapter five, put out into the deep, Peter trusted even though he did not understand. He trusted. Do we trust the plan of God that calls us to live counter-culturally, not to conform to the culture, but to transform the culture? With what? With the language spoken by God. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. How does it end? Listen to him. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless, family. We hope you have enjoyed this presentation of Human Life International. For more information about HLI's mission, please see our website at www.hli.org. That's www.hli.org. Those listeners who wish to order more copies of this recording or other pro-life materials can call us at 1-800-549-LIFE. That's 1-800-549-LIFE.